Uh, but first, we, member of our panel here is Dr. Robert Blank. Dr. Robert Black, who is professor and director for the Institute for International Programs at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. He is a medical epidemiologist uh, who has worked at the Centers for Disease Control and at institutions in Bangladesh and Peru. His research includes field trials of health technologies and evaluation of health service programs in low and middle income countries. His other interests are related to the use of evidence in policy and programs. He is a member of the US Institute of Medicine and serves on advisory boards of the World Health Organization. He has over 650 scientific journal publications. Uh, also on our panel is Dr. Maria Hazapadu, who is currently Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics at the Alexander Technical Education Institution of, of, Thessalon of Thessaloniki. She is head of the postgraduate course on clinical nutrition and director of the Human Nutrition Laboratory and vice president of the research committee at the same institution. She has participated and or coordinated several research projects in the areas of dietary assessment of nutrition evaluation, dietary treatment of obese patients with cardiometabolic disease and childhood obesity. She is a member of the Hellenic Nutrition Policy Committee and has published more than 100 scientific papers. Dr. Joseph Kindler comes to us from Purdue University where he is a postdoctoral research associate. Um, he graduated from the Penn State University which, with a Bachelor of Science in Applied Nutrition Sciences with honors in kinesiology. His dissertation research was aimed at understanding the influence of obesity and uh, related chronic health conditions, namely insulin resistance on adolescent bone growth. He is currently involved in studies examining the influence of adolescence obesity and type 2 diabetes on bone health. Dr. Deanne Liska is Senior Director of Nutrition Science and Biostatistics at Biofortis Mary U Nutrisciences, where she leads the team responsible for scientific consultation, design, and interpretation of clinical trials and scientific literature assessment. She has more than 20 years' experience in the nutrition industry with past leadership roles at Kellogg's, Ocean Spray, and Metagenics. She has authored over 50 peer-reviewed publications and is co-inventor of 12 patents. Dr. Jose Savetra is currently a, or is a pediatric gastroenterologist, clinical investigator, educator, and business executive. He is global chief medical officer for Nestle Nutrition and an associate professor of pediatrics at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has carried out seminal work in the area of probiotics and pediatrics and has an extensive record of publications in nutrition, intestinal and nutritional disorders, immunity, and preventative nutritional strategies. He is also chairman of the board of the Nestle Nutrition Institute. And then our last panelist is Professor Seppo Salomon, who comes to us from the University of Turku uh, in Finland. Uh, he is currently Professor of Food Development for the Health Sciences Program and Director of the Functional Foods Forum in the Faculty of Medicine. His research has focused on gut microbiology and health, the use of probiotics and prebiotics, including functional foods. He is a member of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters and has authored over 400 scientific publications. So that is our panel today. And springboarding off of the session we had this morning, I'd like to start off the panel with a very general question. And that is, in the nutrition community, especially over the past couple years, we have increased consensus on what the outcomes of interest should be for our nutrition-related interventions, dietary and nutrient guidelines. We also increasingly have consensus around the strength of evidence upon which to base those recommendations. But we saw from this morning's session that connection between nutrition, health, and chronic disease is modified by many factors, including environment, 
social behavioral factors, and many other biological and environmental factors. So how are we going to move forward in terms of developing the evidence base with these new standards we have in this very high bar for outcomes, given the complexity of context and the efficacy of any nutrition intervention? So we can start here and just move across. Okay. <clears throat> I think one way one way forward is, is what was presented already in the morning morning to have more sort of meta analysis, more comprehensive meta analysis than we have had before to, to draw some conclusions. But I'd like also to also to add there a, a, a con confounding factor and as as uh, the chairperson told I I work mainly with gastrointestinal microbiology and I think the role of microbes in so-called non-communicable diseases is emerging and maybe <coughs> maybe there is a communicable and non-communicable factor so this might be disturbing in the future thank you um, very very broad question um, let me uh, l admit my pediatric bias and since the meeting is is on childhood um, <laughs> Uh, in fact, a lot was already brought up by, by Maria. Um, the, the first is that uh, we do acknowledge that there's very little data, and the younger we go, the less data there is. We do not have uh, adequate understanding of dietary patterns, especially from zero to four years of age. We have a little bit after that. School kids, we do better. Some in adolescence, and that's about it. Um, the second question is what data to get, because prioritizing and how we do it is, 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 is very difficult. Uh, but I do think there are some constructs, in including what was presented in terms of what is the immediate environment, what the family does, what the community does, and then what the other parts of society can, uh, can contribute. Um, however, when we really look at return on investment and where we can maximize the chances that we actually can first decide what outcomes to study, um, I think again, you know, the first thousand days continues uh, uh, to increasingly uh, demonstrate uh, the fact that if we were going to get a larger return on the investment for what data to gather, how to gave, gather it, and then how to interpret it to then come up with recommendations uh, is where the focus should be. Well, I, I would support um, what both of the panelists said and just amplify uh, a bit. I think with, um, with the issues in low and middle income countries and trying to improve the growth of, of children, I think it's, um, it's complicated and, and, and probably similar concepts uh, apply in uh, the high income countries as well. I think one, is, as Patrick talked about, the, the uh, epigenetic phenomena that uh, are important and I think we're increasingly recognizing that the um, nutritional conditions or the health conditions of, of women at the time of, of conception or perhaps even issues prior to conception and certainly during early pregnancy are important. And so um, we haven't talked about the role of, of fetal development and, and uh, you know, fetal um, nutritional conditions as, as they lead into um, childhood or infancy. But then after birth, um, we also uh, heard from our, our panelists here the, the issues around the uh, microbial uh, contamination, microbial issues. And, and I, I think when, when I um, began work in uh, low-income countries, it was a lot about the, the illnesses that contributed to undernutrition, the infectious diseases, diarrhea in particular, that contributed to undernutrition. I think they're still there. They still do contribute. I think we're now learning a lot more about the, um, the, in the intestinal exposure to microorganisms, many of which don't cause disease overtly, uh, but they change the, uh, the functioning of the gut and the, and the microbiome. And I will hear this afternoon, actually, about one of the studies from Mark Miller, of the longitudinal studies related to subclinical infections and how they affect growth. So when we're, um, we're in these, these settings in, in low-income countries, we, we have to think about the diet. It's, it's critically important. But we have to think about 
the environment and we have to think about the, the maternal influences on, uh, on the, uh, the growth of the fetus and ultimately the, the infant as well. Well, I'm going to focus more on one aspect, which is funding and the idea of um, what Patrick had brought in, but I think we saw across the board is observational, which are what most of our nutrition um, past studies have been and past guidelines have been based on, and the need for RCTs. Um, there's challenges with RCTs. Um, one of them is funding, and I think funding is, is a big factor. Um, but there's also challenges in RCTs tend to be uh, specific to certain nutrients they're designed for individual nutrient or you know specific types of interactions so we have to understand the role of observational versus rcts in setting guidelines and we do need more rct data another um I'll issue in the u.s in particular and i think it's global but certainly there's mm -hmm. been a lot of conversation mm -hmm. in the u.s in the scientific community is reproducibility and reliability of data and setting standards or understanding how RCTs should be conducted for nutrition. The majority of past RCTs don't have baseline data. They don't have a lot of dietary background data. And they actually don't meet a lot of high, higher quality standards. So even in our RCT area, our quality of data is, is pretty low in general. So I think those are areas that we can focus on. I totally agree with you. And RCTs are, uh, we need more RCTs, but it's important to, to for us to put the standards from the beginning, what we want to have. And also our end result, because sometimes we don't really use all the results that we have from an RCT. So this is a cost effectiveness, which is something else regarding not only money, but also how we're going to use the results in a better way. Uh, so if we start an RCT, knowing from the beginning what we want to have at the end result, it's better. So we need to have good standards from the beginning. And this is part of the work we did in, uh, in, in JAMPA was to uh, decide which were going to be the criteria and which system of criteria we're going to use. And there are a number of systems like RATE or REAIM and other ones that you can mm -hmm. use in order to be able to validate uh, the results of an RCT. And um, the matter of cost effectiveness, I think we have to stay a little bit more on that because if we go at the end of the day, we have to go back to the governments and persuade them because, okay, well, all agree that we are lacking data, okay? <laughs> and we're lacking money. So the question is who's going to give us this money? And if we go back to the governments or even to different, you know, um, uh, possible uh, um, people that will give us money, we have to persuade them. Okay, so we need to have more studies of the cost effectiveness of what we're doing. And uh, for example, I was talking about uh, different um, um, interventions using <coughs> parents or parents and children or using school and family. So which ones are more effective and which m which studies cost less? So I think this is something we have to have more data than <coughs> all over the world. Yeah, I think I kind of want to echo on the previous points here about the, the need for well-controlled, um, well-conducted, randomized uh, studies um, with good rigor and, uh, and control, of course. Um, it does bring up the point of, of money uh, with respect to, to bone, you know, it, to, run a, to run an intervention focused on bone mineral content, for instance, in, in children, you would need at least nine months to be able to, to see an effect. That's sort of the amount of time, seven to nine to ten months, uh, to be able to, to see a true effect on that phenotype. So you kind of take a step back and say, can we look at biomarkers of bone turnover? It might provide an uh, insight, but there's such variability in, in children that those measurements might not be indicative. So um, it becomes difficult. We do now have more sensitive bone phenotyping, but that doesn't couple well with the history of data that's already been accrued. So uh, comparing across studies becomes difficult. Um, I was recently at a conference last uh, in December that it was focused predominantly put together by experts in the nutrition and bone field, and there was a session just like this, kind of putting the great minds together that were in the room and what are the steps that we need to take to progress this field? Developing effective strategies to optimize peak bone mass. Um, so there are efforts in kind of gauging that. Uh, Connie Weaver, Rob Daly, Heike Bischoff-Ferrari, um, all putting their heads together, really experts in those fields. So um, there are efforts, uh, but it comes down to uh, the money being available to, to conduct these studies that we really do need. So. Very good. Any other comments on that? So I guess the, the other general question I'd like to ask, and this is particularly a problem in the U.S., because now 
if we're going to set nutrient guidelines based on chronic disease prevention, and we establish those numbers, we're going to be held to them. And the expectation then is, given this investment of resources, that chronic diseases are going to come down, right? Um, but one of the you know, confounders we heard in all three talks this morning, whether our outcome is growth or whether it's obesity or whether it's bone health, there were unexpected were outcomes or null findings, or there was population heterogeneity that contributed then to whether or not, or the degree to which the intervention was efficacious. And when we think about chronic disease prevalence, it's highest in low-income communities. That's where the chronic disease is you know, most prevalent, so that's where we really have to focus our efforts. But these low-income communities have the least access to the type of foods and related science and technologies that we've heard about in terms of whether it's understanding the microbiome or the epigenetic profiles, et cetera. They have the least access to the science and the technologies that offer potential solutions to that connection between diet and health. So how do we make sure that if the focus is to use nutrition to lowest chronic disease, that low-income communities not only benefit from this, but actually drive our success as a community. I'll leave that. Oh. Yeah. So it's a tough question. Um, lower income communities obviously are at great risk for these chronic diseases. So uh, trying to develop uh, educational strategies to get get these points across in a consumable, digestible way. Um, some of the barriers in terms of uh, you know per parents providing meals for their children to to improve dairy consumption, fiber <coughs> consumption, fruits and vegetables, um, it could be something such as you know just lack of skills and knowledge in terms of how to, how to prepare these meals. So educational uh, programs in terms of teaching these individuals how to prepare uh, meals that sort of maintains the integrity of of the food component in terms of nutrient composition, but also palatability, so that their child is actually going to want to eat the meal. So um, yeah, it's a very important thing to get on top of. Although I'm not an expert in uh, um, the problems that um, uh, these countries are facing, I'm actually, as you see, I've concentrated mainly in, in European countries and obesity. I would say that uh, there are some common um, you know, strategies that are regarding, for example, reformulation, and I believe somebody will be more expert on that. But in, uh, in Europe, at least, we're discussing a lot about the area of reformulation and how we're going to really um, tackle this, 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 let's call it, uh, um, possibility of improving our nutrition. And um, I think uh, we need, again, more research on this area, because if you're asking me, I'm not sure I know exactly <laughs> what reformulation would have to do in which products, and there's a lot of discussion around this area, so I believe this is an area we have to, to, to work on. And uh, also another area that uh, is, um, I believe interesting for all the countries is the area of food labeling. Because there, there is also a lot of, um, um, let's say, questions of how parents or the families are able to understand what they buy regarding, because, okay, I agree with the fresh food and more fruits and vegetables, etc., etc. But when you go to the processed food, and sometimes you need the processed food, uh, Okay, we say less processed food, but you go to the supermarket and you buy something that is processed and then you have to be <coughs> able to understand what is there. So if we educate, for example, the family, uh, for example, to eat more, more uh, products rich in calcium and they are not able to understand if this product is rich in calcium, then we're really having a problem. So we have to decide in which ways we have to make the, the, the food labeling in such a way that is at least I don't know, it's going to be universal, but in Europe we are talking about European, at least, food labeling, so because all the products <coughs> are traveling around Europe. So if you have a system, it's better to have the same system. And now you know there are a lot of systems, like traffic lights, mm -hmm. like uh, the key, you know, the mm -hmm. key, and it's green or <laughs> other colors. And also, it could be, it's a lot of discussion, if we could have a system like, uh, you know, having for the tobacco, this is a healthy food, this is an unhealthy food, and this, if you are eating a non-healthy food, this is going to be the cause of that. So there are these issues that I think we need to, 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 to emphasize on regarding food reformulation, regarding food labeling. And food labeling, we're talking about food labeling, is not only the processed foods or the foods we have from the supermarket, but it's also the foods we are eating in restaurants. 
and there's a lot of discussion. Do we need to have some information? And I believe we should. Mm -hmm. And should we really have a law that we say that all the restaurants should have at least these particular nutrients? Again, if you educate, educate the family and they go to a restaurant, they have to be able to understand what they're eating. So food labeling and uh, also labeling in uh, places like restaurants, this includes also canteens, this includes schools and regulation in schools. There is a lot of uh, <coughs> discussion now what we call food procurement in mm -hmm. Europe. All these foods that the schools are buying, what are going to be the char characteristics? Because now in, in most countries, it's cool, uh, is uh, you know, uh, buying the food. But if we have some particular characteristics that are specific from, okay, the Ministry of uh, mm. Health, I don't know where from, this is going to be very helpful for all the food that is sold in the, in the schools. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. Um, we have a, a lot of examples of single food type approaches that haven't worked. And, you know, I have experience with examples of improving food quality of um, foods for people and they don't buy them, right? Um, even when it's clear what, what the differences are. So, you know, we, we have to consider the customer and the consumer in this and we have to consider their values and we have to consider how they consume. And there's a lot of um, questions being asked right now, not just about what is consumed, because we have data that says, you know, two groups can consume similar amounts or in similar types of foods, but you get different outcomes. Maybe how they consume it. There's timing of intake, and there's how it fits into their diet. So I think, and then there's the, the concept that, that um, Joseph just brought up, as well as about palatability and sensory. And I know there's some studies with infants right now on complementary foods and looking at sensory characteristics and that's just emerging data. And how maybe thinking more like how do you make this something that comes part of the value system because becomes part of, you know, from early stages on. So thinking more broadly than single food. But could you comment on the effect of SCS? So how does socioeconomic right. status affect so food values? How does that affect how health does it affect, values? Yeah, and so there's a couple studies recently in the U.S. looking at so obesity in children and finding obesity in children, of course, in higher and lower income um, communities as well as in, say, Mexican Americans, so in certain groups. And there's one study that looked at caloric intake and said, well, it's similar, but there's more obesity in Mexican Americans than in others, even though the caloric intake is similar. So that gets to, is it the food, the, um, the types of foods they're consuming? Is it the, the t a way they're consuming the foods? <coughs> and if we're going to affect SES, we have a lot of single mothers we, you know, who are using processed food because they, they need to. So we need to consider that, that whole um, value chain and what that individual is experiencing and try to fit in this into their actual daily lives. So I think that's, we have to think about that and not tr try to get people who have a certain value system or ethnic eating pattern to eat differently. I would say that's, that's their value. So how do we fit into that versus the other way around? So uh, in regard to um, the, the recommendations for uh, nutrient intake to prevent chronic disease, I guess I'd make a, a couple of comments. Um, largely, these are well initially based on observational studies of dose response. And, and I think in those, we don't always have the population heterogeneity that we might want to be able to make mm -hmm. recommendations more nuanced in regard to subsets of the population. But, but then uh, even more so, when you get to randomized trials where you might try different doses on a prevention of a chronic disease, we, we often don't have the, the population uh, heterogeneity there either to represent uh, those who may be in the um, you know, more disadvantaged strata. And I would, I would say that's even more so where there are fewer data of any kind, observational or randomized trials in uh, low-income countries where the, those who have been disadvantaged and undernourished early in life with the developmental origins of, of chronic disease hypothesis likely have greater risk and maybe different differential you know, benefits or effects of micronutrients early or later in their life course. And 
you know, when we're, we're looking at these effects related to chronic disease, we're often looking in the adults, but in fact, a lot of the conditions are happening earlier on or being, you know, preconditioned earlier on that might, might predispose then to the chronic disease. So then we're talking about different kinds of data and long-term evaluations of, of outcomes. And, and I, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult for, for any countries, high-income countries, where there's a lot of work going on to do this, but just to take it to other countries where they don't have the same resources to do the, um, the studies of reference, uh, reference values. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, just from observing um, things through an initiative I'm currently involved in, with the, the high-income countries working on things like folate or sodium potassium, there's, there's sort of a simultaneous interest in this, and I would say some inefficiencies and duplication of, of efforts where, you know, EFSA and the U.S. and Australians and, you know, are all doing systematic reviews and sort of struggling with the same issues at the same time, really without a lot of communication. And, I, you know, I'm not in the regulatory business or really in the business of setting reference intakes, but one would hope for a a more open collaborative process and maybe a more unified or harmonized process that, that might be a more efficient and better way to go about and getting the data and getting the, uh, getting the recommendations. But for low-income countries that don't have anything close to the resources of uh, the U.S. Or, or the European countries, to be able to know what their reference value should be and how that might relate to both deficiencies, but your question is about chronic disease. I think there we really need to have, you know, better coordination, collaboration, and better assistance to those countries to help if we really think of this as a global issue and a global need. Um, I'll touch on just three things. Um, uh, first, uh, the, the the point of um, lower middle income countries and SES. Um, I think. Today, just to, just as an example of the way that Bob brought up the difference between secure and non-secure, low SES in a place where there's, in quotes, food security is different than low SES yes. in a food where there is, in quotes, food insecurity, uh, and the recommendations would not be the same. In fact, they would might be the opposite. Second point is r relates to if and how we harmonize regulation as it relates to what could or should. I mean, this is short of you know, ultimately, potentially coming to some kind of harmonization, uh, especially in especially in, in in early life, but certainly uh, 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 for her afterwards. Um, one because of the different um, social, political, and geographic areas that 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 uh, we would be addressing at a global level. But even in places where we theoretically have more food security or at least access, or in those places where we do have. Uh, uh, or he can segregate populations into low, middle, high, SES, et cetera, where the problems might be, might be similar, you know, in Europe, North America in particular, there is no harmonization. Sure. You have to, and, uh, and, uh, and the last piece, which, which, which I, I think is, is, is critical, was brought up already, is um, what's the information the, the, the parents, uh, the consumers are uh, actually getting? While it is important for them to know this is rich in calcium or not, without education, it really doesn't matter how much information. In fact, I would argue there's too much already, especially when we don't know what to do with the information. That's right. So uh, I, I think from that point of view, uh, last point I'll make, one of the things that might actually help all this is uh, for governments, because the money's not just going to come from the governments from regulators, because the rules are not just going to come from regulators, and then uh, from both the healthcare professionals in the broader, in the broader sense, both uh, clinical and, and, and public health, because uh, the information to people is not just going to come from them. And when it comes to education, you know, I, I do think the, the opportunities for, and again, uh, what we would call today uh, um, either uh, multi-sectorial, cross-sectorial, intersectorial, I mean, you pick the word, um, is not happening. And the dialogue 
is just not happening. And if the dialogue doesn't happen, we can put all the labels and the red signs and all the traffic lights, <laughs> et cetera. Without education, they're <laughs> meaningless. Uh, I, I think the opportunity for increasing the channels for dialogue so that uh, those that actually know how to make certain foods or make them available even if they're not processed uh, and those that consume it uh, is, 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 uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, I very much agree with you on, on, on the communication and increasing the communication and independent on whether it's food security or insecurity in the country. And I think I, I would take two examples. The important thing to me would be in the, in the very low income countries to work, work locally. And uh, we have uh, an interesting example from Argentina <coughs> where in the Tucuman province, uh, the government-sponsored Institute of Dairy Research actually developed a, a probiotic, mm -hmm. local probiotic. And it was given to small companies in the different parts of the province to actually pro uh, uh, produce. They trained the people to produce the product and it's provided to schools. 200,000 uh, children in the province every day receive this product as a snack, school snack. For us, it's... Uh, maybe marginal, but they don't have any school meals. In, in Scandinavian countries, everybody has a free school meal, very carefully nutritionally designed and, and even sensory properties today taken into account. But for these children, it might be the only, only thing they get during the day. And now they are also conducting, uh, conducting impact assessment. Does it have an impact on health in the longer run? And uh, it's, it's spreading to the neighboring provinces as well. So that might be a very cost-effective way and it's increasing local activity. It's, it's providing good nutrition, at least for that small part and perhaps even preventing marginalization of the, of the kids. So I think that serves as a, as a very nice, uh, very nice uh, example on, on how to do it locally in the very poor province area. When it comes to, when it comes to us then, it's very difficult to I, c I cannot help taking, taking up the European health train regulation that required nutrient profiles to be set up. I think there was a two-year deadline. The regulation came into force in 2006 and 2008. We were supposed to have nutrient profiles. I was working with the expert committee myself during that time and we produced, EFSA produced a proposal for nutrient guidelines and uh, nutrient profiles. And it started... Uh, gave it uh, as a scientific opinion to the EU Commission as, is, as it's supposed to do. And conversation has gone on and on and on until the European Parliament in 2016 scrapped the whole idea because they couldn't get into an agreement. 402 votes against it and 285 for it. It was scrapped due to serious and persistent problems in in implementation and market distortion. So if we cannot even in European Union <laughs> with a 10-year discussion agree upon nutrient profiles, how can we proceed elsewhere? Of course, we have different dietary habits, north and south. Uh, Maria was very nicely demonstrating that and Im impact on nutrition, but still we need what Jose was saying, communication between the different parties and coming to an agreement. Very good. So I'm going to ask the panel one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. But it, it does relate to regulation. And I think there is some hope in that um, this past October, the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. and the World Health Organization held a workshop to try to harmonize approaches to setting dietary reference intakes. And the goal was there won't be a single... DRI for the world, right, or DRIs for the world, but at least the approaches that each country uses will be the same. So hopefully there'll be more commonality if each country uses the same approaches than any contextual factors associated with a particular region or country, you know, might change that number, but at least everybody is using the same approaches. And I guess that's one way to move forward. But when I ask particularly our two friends here from the private sector, between people and chronic disease, right, and the food supply is the industry. 
And so when you talk about the role of industry and, you know, assisting the public health community in achieving chronic disease prevention through food, what are the major regulatory barriers you see both with, within and across countries? Um, we have limited time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me just pick a few. Sure. Mm. Um, uh, th the first is uh, a common language. Uh, when we talk about prevention of NCDs, right, then suddenly this food company became a pharma company because you're not reducing risk, you're preventing, you're supposed to do the same thing that a vaccine or an antibiotic does. Even the language today is not agreed on. So the first is to find a common language. Uh, not only within regulatory agencies, but with regulatory agencies and um, uh, uh, government and the private sector. <coughs> that language does not exist today. Uh, and this is part of why it gets hung up sometimes in, in, in a vote that never goes anywhere because you're arguing about one word. Um, and this is an issue as it relates to even the scientific arguments for it because if a nutrient may or may not be uh, deficient in a particular population for a particular disease, it may become a conditionally necessary nutrient. Does that make it a drug and does that force some uh, private sector, some companies to get an investigational drug number to test a vitamin that they can get off the shelf? So. Th th that common language and understanding of how it is that we can do research uh, would be one step forward. Um, there's many, 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 of course, uh, in, in between, but let me just jump to the end, some of which was al already mentioned today. Uh, if we are going to have, quote unquote, intakes of some form in some guidance, um, I, I do again believe that the, uh, uh, the greater focus in early life makes it easier because the needs are not going to be very different. Uh, they're going to become different as you get older, but they're going to be very, very, uh, uh, very close the earlier in life we're, we're, we're talking about. But even when you get to those uh, uh, early life and early childhood, then how do you convince a population to do something? Because in the end, it's uh, in in the end, it's action. And I go back to the point of education. Just giving information is not enough, and just providing foods that have the right information so that they can meet the right profiling that some uh, governments suddenly decide they want, for example, doesn't mean anything. In fact, uh, some lipid supplements, uh, the foie gras I had day before yesterday. In coming here, <laughs> and, uh, and and some wonderful high-end desserts that I can find in Lima when I go there, which you know would have all these red, red, red dots of nutrient profiling. You know, not only have a role because I'm not going to stop eating the foie gras, yeah. but I don't know how to eat it, or I didn't tell the consumer how to consume it. So again, information alone is not. <coughs> My, what I think, uh, where we need to go uh, to is not just providing foods, food supply, and foods uh, that are quote-unquote healthier, but to increase the demand of those foods. And only when the offer that industry can provide meets the demand that education can provide, we'll meet on a healthier plane. So I think one and I agree with everything you said, so I'm going to try to not, not duplicate. But one, one area is that when we think of chronic disease and health, we think of dietary patterns. And you even talked about dietary patterns. And, and companies make foods. They make individual foods. And, you know, is the individual food bad or do you try to control the dietary pattern through all these individual foods? That's, that's kind of where we are right now. We're kind of caught up in we're going to try to control the foods so we can change the dietary patterns. But I, you know, it doesn't seem like that's, we're really all together on that and that that's working. Um, to your point, you know, a dessert can fit into a healthy dietary pattern. Um, you just need to figure out how to do it. But if you have good food, bad food, then you start having people at odds. And that's where we are right now. Um, in terms of um, trying to help people find healthy foods, 
there's a huge risk and barrier to talk about the benefits of foods right now. And I think the U.S. is a microcosm of what you're saying. Because in the U.S., we talk about FDA. FDA is not the scariest organization for foods. It's the FTC. Um, drugs don't deal with this. They, they are all under FDA for advertising and foods. But in the U.S., there's different groups you have to think about when you talk about claims. You have the Food and Trade Commission, which is about all the advertising. The FDA is the label on the food and the, the point of sale materials. Um, then you have attorney generals in all the states and then individual lawsuits. So when you're dealing with claims, you're not dealing with a series of regulations that you have to meet and you actually know ahead of time, well, now I'm okay, I've got my substantiation X. You know, you have to take into account a lot of other factors. And, and I think the barrier to talk about positive benefits of foods is very, very high. The risk is just very, very high for a lot of, of consumer foods. And I think the last point, too, is that with conventional foods, they're made for the entire population. So you have one food, and it's really labeled based on adults. So how do you figure out, to your point, we have, we have so much information, but now what we're saying is we need more information. <coughs> we need to say each food, as it relates to a child, as it relates to a child under this condition, under that condition, you know, how do we, how are we going to do that within the regulatory framework? And, you know, we look to policy for that. But I think with foods, just accurate information on what the food is. But n maybe it's policy and other approaches we do in terms of how that food fits into health. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I just wanted to say that the da tango is danced by two. That means that we have to do both ways. What I mean is what I meant before is not, not, not to have more information. Of course, we, we need to have information that is better understood by the people. Yes. So that doesn't mean that we don't need information, in my opinion. Of course, we need information and we have to work. And you, I mean, the food industry can help, and I believe they will in this area. Definitely, at the same time, all the public health people or whatever, they need to, to, to make this information uh, easier and better understood by the people. Definitely, I agree that we do have an amount of information, but not on everything we need. So I, I a little bit disagree that, yes, we need more information, if possible. The way we're going to translate this information so it would be understood by common people is also an important thing. Very good. Thank you. So let's open up to the floor now for questions. But I do want each of you at the end just to think about what is the most effective thing we can do in the short term to really move the field forward to achieving that connection between food and health in various settings. Um, but we open up now to the floor for questions. Mark. Yes, I have uh, three comments and questions. The first one is uh, clearly, well, you mentioned, for instance, inter-individual variability of a variety of biomarkers. I was just wondering whether longitudinal study could allow actually to tackle this inter-individual variability and then we should actually reason more not on cross-sectional studies but more on a trend and evolution for a given individual of a particular marker. The second point is, uh, well, there have been lots of discussion, particularly in the immuno-oncology field, so very different, but where we have a, a very large number of ongoing clinical studies to assess a variety of combination of drugs and so. And the big issue is to design actually preclinical models that could allow to identify reliable biomarkers and uh, the, a, a big issue that has been discussed is how we can design, well design actually, small scale clinical studies in order to perform translation, reverse translation and improve the design of preclinical uh, models then in the, uh, afterwards will help actually improve the design of uh, relevant biomarkers. So it's a kind of back and forth interaction between clinical studies and uh, preclinical studies. Finally, uh, the third comment is, uh, well, we are dealing here with a very, very complex issue. And, uh, and, and I'm just wondering whether uh, how we can actually design reductionist approach to tackle such a complex problem. Should we uh, consider a more systemic approach when dealing with societal or education aspects? 
and should we uh, focus exclusively on uh, deeper profiling? And so this is in line actually with my previous comment. When we are dealing with more simplistic approach, when we want to assess, for instance, the impact of a given nutrient deficiency on a given physiopathological outcome, then in this case, should we exclusively rely on a deeper profiling of the individuals, better stratification of the individuals, and then in this case, we definitely have actually to rely on perhaps more costly uh, studies, but that might be perhaps much more informative and then could help uh, further design future studies. So, Someone want to comment on that? I can, I can start in terms of how you deal with the complexity and what type of studies that you can do to move forward. And that Chronic Disease Endpoint Committee considered an example, which I think thought was brilliant. Um, I shouldn't say that. I wasn't a member of the committee, but I wasn't the one who came up with this. But um, they used for the first time a big data approach and then married that to, small, to a small clinical study. And that is they wanted to ask, countries were asking the WHO, what level should we fortify the food supply to prevent neural tube defects? So they wanted that guidance. And so the way that the recommendation rolled out was that the CDC had big data. That big data was all focused around blood folate levels. So if you look, let me put, put, put it this way. If you look at a nutrient intake level or food intake or dietary pattern, there's an incredible amount of noise in that data. If you look at a disease endpoint, there can be a lot of noise around that. For neural tube defects, there's not, but there's a lot of noise. But one approach to do it is to anchor in the middle. That is, measure something that you can measure reliably with high precision and accuracy. And in this case, they use blood folate levels. And they use big data because there was a lot of big data around intake to blood levels. And there were data around blood levels modified by environment, by genetics, and everything else. You put all that into the model. And then blood levels to neural tube defect. So what they did is daisy chained the data and then came up with a completely computer generated dose response relationship which was big data driven, it's, it's not real data. But then there were a couple small studies done in the clinic, right, looking at that connection between blood levels and neural tube defects that overlaid perfectly on the big data that came from multi-countries, all observational data, that validated essentially the big data. And so what's important is to find that biomarker that you can measure and anchor to work backwards to nutrient intake, forward to disease, then you can then generate these models, all observational, and then validate them in a small clinical study. So that's one way, at least, that, that was recommended by WHO in that recommendation they gave for neural tube defect prevention. How broadly applicable that is isn't known, but it is a way to inexpensively deal with some of the complexity, again, using observational data, then validating whatever the computer-generated dose response curve is. But well, I hope I'm, I'm understanding your question, but I think um, when you talked about better stratification of individual data, better profiling, et cetera, and we think about big data, there's a, a number of discussions going on in the U.S. research community mm -hmm. around big data, transparency of data, and, and you know, access to data. And I think there's, there's some barriers to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, the recent um, um, National Academy of Sciences Research Integrity mm -hmm. report that came out looked at who's funding clinical studies. And you know, industry funds about 50% or more clinical studies in both pharma and, and nutrition. Um, but there's not a protection for industry when they do fund the studies. So you know, it's, there's no proprietary control for industry unless they keep the, the data private. So this is a, an issue for some data around clinical studies um, that we have to get over because there is discussion now about making studies transparent. There's, there's a lot of discussion about how do you have databases that are consistent and there's a lot of data structure challenges in that um, to bring different clinical trial data together. It's not a simple thing. Um, 
just in terms of data structure, but it's hap happening in the pharmaceutical industry and some pharma companies are finding ways to do that and s still keep parts of their data proprietary. So I think the nutrition field, I can tell you, at least in the US with ILSI and some other groups are actually having these discussions and you know, hopefully they will go to a place where we'll have more data available of that type. Um, but I think also helping to support industry funding of studies and finding ways to show that, you know, keep the integrity of the studies, but get, keep that funding going is important. Um, but biomarkers or, or knowing what the biomarkers should be to have consistently across studies and knowing what, how to profile subjects at the beginning of a study. There's a very, very um, gap, big gap in what should be the main, just here, if you do five things, what do you do? You know, I think we all do weight, we all do age, we all do height. Maybe that's about it. You know, you need to have, what is that list of, of profiling subjects so that when you get the data, you can actually compare your subjects. Other comments? I mean, another area that there's a lot of interest in the community that really hasn't been so much involved in the nutrition space is people who look at biomarkers of aging. And if age is one of the major risk factors for chronic disease, then maybe we should be looking at how nutrition modifies biomarkers of aging and bring sort of harmonize the relationship between aging biomarkers and nutritional function or status biomarkers. That's one of them, absolutely. Other comments? M maybe just one comment that uh, actually m may may apply to 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 not only the uh, uh, understanding of uh, what are the risk factors, uh, whether epigenetic or whether uh, uh, identifiable via a bio a biomarker, but it is the use of technology and and, and big data, um, which is going to make it easier as it relates to having to do an RCT for almost everything that you need yeah. to show. It is just getting increasingly harder for all kinds of reasons that we just mentioned here, uh, including legal and regulatory uh, uh, reasons outside just from having you know good standing hypotheses uh, when you're looking for one specific outcome. Um, this allows you to do uh, a much broader uh, spectrum of potential outcomes and finding correlations and associations we may not even know today that exist. That's on the quote unquote understanding of the problem or diagnostic side. But I think even on the interventional side, uh, the, 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 uh, the approaches, and again, uh, the truth is that technology has provided us, and, and, uh, and yes, I don't disagree, but we need more information. But if you Google something, you get more than you want, more than you need, and probably more than you should yes. be looking <laughs> at, right? So the info is out there. The data is not, and that's the problem, right? But if you look at that end of the spectrum, I think, again, Technology may actually bring us opportunities to identify. To, I mean, dietary records, as you very well pointed out today, is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, dietary surveys are, are you know, a rather primitive way of doing an understanding what people eat. Uh, and I think technology is bringing us much better uh, approaches to doing that. Um, anthropometrics, you know, it, it's weight and length have been kind of the gold standard, right? But as we also heard, even that's not always reliable, right. the way that we get this data. But if you crowdsource, uh, even with those big variations, you start seeing you know, patterns that would be hard to see uh, when you're doing just uh, plain RCT. So I think, and, and last thing I'll say for technology, from the interventional point of view, I do believe education ultimately will go that way. Expecting physicians, healthcare professionals, educate you know, parents on, on nutrition um, is, is not scalable. It's probably at this stage we have to distinguish between um, recommendations for the public and what we call recommendations for the individual. And uh, because in my mind, these are two different aspects of the same problem, but we need different parameters or different inputs to decide. For example, what we are talking about is going to what we call personalized nutrition, which is something we're getting to. That means you know my genetics and you know my <laughs> <laughs> habits and all my family characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. And I go to the health professional and he has my profile based on all the data he gets, my medical record, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some very good uh, studies going on in Europe. And I believe we are getting there somehow, at least in the West countries. So, well, how do you call it? The, the, the higher, let's call it better, <laughs> socioeconomic. Uh, uh, status countries, but 
I'm not sure we're getting there at all in the low socioeconomic status countries. And on the other hand, we have to, to address the problem of the public health nutrition, which is a little bit different. I'm not sure that with all this big data and all this technology, we're going to address the problem of public health nutrition. We're more mainly going to address the personalized nutrition. Thank you. Other questions? Um, my name is Louise Dye. I'm a psychologist from the University of Leeds. And <clears throat> I found the comments very interesting. I agree very much with what Jose said about um, socioeconomic status being, <coughs> excuse me, being intricately linked with food insecurity. I, am I far away from the microphone? Sorry. I, I was trying to say I agree with what Jose said about socioeconomic status being intrinsically linked to food security. But I also think there's a need for us to not, I think there's a, a tendency within the nutrition community to unintentionally regard these people who are out there whose diet we wish to improve as um, inactive recipients of information. So what is missing is really an understanding about how we change people's behavior. And giving information is not, as Jose also said, is not the thing. Everybody has access to that information. It's how we empower people to be able to change behavior. So we need to understand the drivers of behavior change, but far more importantly, the barriers of behavior change. So I, I'd like you to inject a bit of psychology into this sort of discussion, if that's OK. Thank you very much for asking that. I, I could not agree more. Uh, I, I think we tend to confuse information with education. Th they're not the same. You need information to be educated, but you can't be educated with just information. And, uh, and, uh, and, and here, I, I do believe we have another opportunity. Because if we start injecting what can and should be educational framework theory to change dietary behaviors, not a food uh, identification of an issue or not an issue, but the dietary uh, pattern, especially in early life, and especially we have the opportunity that parents can feed babies. Uh, the beauty of babies is they, they're fed, so there's at least an opportunity to have control. The possibility of educating a parent, which means information that is given in a motivational way, in an anticipatory way, in a sequential way, not in the Google way, in a sequential way, with the right support and with the right tools, is, is, is the way to go. Now, the problem is that historically, we've tried to give that education through the standard approaches that we have, which is either through the family, the community, or the healthcare professionals, which are honestly the, the, the least effective in providing education to change the behavior. In fact, the beauty of infancy is you don't even have to change a behavior. A mother that has a child for the first time doesn't have a baggage of behavior yet, because you only have a baby a first time, one time. And you can be, and you actually can be educated. And I go back to what I said before. That can only be done today through technology. In fact, this is what can help low middle income countries because the access to technology in those countries today is far, far from, uh, you know, what we still think. You know, there's mobile phones in the middle of nowhere today, right, that can serve as tools to, to do that. If I could just comment on that. I don't know if you're aware of the early trials that were funded by NHLBI, but this was a series of trials looking at the effect of essentially cell phone on behavior change. And there one, one was focused on postpartum weight loss, one on smoking, but there were a series of these where the control group was just given what the recommendations were. And then the intervention arm got daily texts had to participate in electronic chat rooms, but they were just bombarded in participating in, in activities around the guidelines and interacting with each other. And none of them were successful. In fact, in some of them, those who had the social media bombardment did worse. And the thought is, is because you got to the least common denominator. People would say, oh, I can't do this, oh, neither can I, and just go down, down, down. The only one that showed any efficacy, and it worked independent, I believe, of SES, is when you put a deceiver in who says, oh, I ran 10 miles yesterday, and I feel great, and I did this. And then everybody chases you know, the successful person. But that's a real question. We're going to you know, 
we can have wonderful scientific evidence and then have these recommendations that are all evidence-based, but if people don't follow them, what have we done? Other questions? There's a question here. Yes, I, I just wanted to comment on what you said, Patrick, about um, this change of paradigm going rather on developing a new generation of biomarkers for adequacy. I'm just wanting to ask you whether you had an idea of what kind of clinical design or preclinical models could be used to address as well the um, level of toxicity of potential overdosage of micronutrients. You know, that, that's a huge issue, especially when you start looking at nutrient requirements in chronic disease, where in some cases you do see efficacy with highly elevated doses when you have to get across a barrier or you're trying to compensate for a loss of function. And again, the, the medical food community and the inborn errors in metabolism is the best source of history we have for this. But we have very little information about, you know, what a UL is for many nutrients, and we don't have good biomarkers, and we don't have data. Um, and I, I, you know, the, you know, I, I can tell you in the field that I'm most familiar with in folate, it's a real problem because what you have is, you know, a biological premise or a hypothesis for risk, but you don't have data. But that hypothesis is sometimes sufficient to, you know, halt any sort of an intervention or a policy. And so that's an area that everyone is concerned about for public safety, but also to enable interventions to make sure that, that we can implement ones that we know that work. Um, but there are very, very little data, and it's very difficult to get work like that funded. The, the upper level or the toxicity is a very interesting area right now, um, and it involves toxicologists as well. And in fact, the toxicologists are taking this issue on because there are now, um, people are looking at things like LDL and using that as an endpoint that's a negative endpoint to try to set limits for things. And traditionally in um, toxicology for a while traditionally, but also currently even in, in nutrition, we have data at high level intakes and then we tend to draw a linear line and say, oh, no, no amount is good. So that's the kind of um, approach we take. The toxicology field has moved into a different approach where they're modeling whether there's a threshold level and looking differently at data. And I think nutrition hasn't quite gotten there yet. So there's a lot of discussion about negative nutrients. So this is not always about upper level, but also the negative nutrient issue. And it's an active debate right now of how that should be looked at with nutrition for what's, what's negative. Um, but there is, like I say, a lot of the toxicologists coming together with nutrition scientists at the table is, I think, where we need to go with that discussion. And if you look, there's a very good chapter in that report for chronic disease endpoints for setting DRIs. Because for chronic disease, often you have an inverted U shape in terms of the dose response to a chronic disease. That's why, but they didn't set a UL based on chronic <coughs> disease, right? They decided to set a range in which you are, you know, going to prevent the chronic disease from occurring. But it's not a UL because it's not toxicology, it's something different. So there's a chapter on that, and it is very much nuanced around what you described. Oh, there was a question over here, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Maureen Black from University of Maryland. Um, sort of two things. Uh, I was going to um, uh, comment a bit on the education and on uh, Dr. Saavedra's point uh, in terms of creating demand. One of the things that we have learned is that uh, adherence is an enormous issue in uh, throughout medicine. So one can be giving recommendations but adherence to those is a, is a very complex issue. And when we look at how people make decisions um, about what food to purchase, about how to feed it to their children, there's a, it's not a simple issue at, at all. Many factors go into it. The nutrients is one factor, but there are many, many other factors that one has to consider. And to consider the, when your example for uh, the NHLBI of having a, um, uh, a text that comes and telling people what to do, 
is not really consistent with what we know about behavior change. So uh, I think that we have much to learn about how to share information, and there's a, there's a bi-directional process. So it doesn't work the same for everyone. There's also a process of altering the environment. You know, if you go into a store in many, throughout the world and you have two little kids with you and you're looking at labels, it's impossible. It's not anyone who can do that. You know, please, it is impossible. That's not an effective way to try and share information. So I think that we have to broaden our science to be able to understand how we can communicate in a way that is, it goes reciprocal and so that we can meet people's needs. There are strategies, for example, um, looking at how children choose their meals in school, and it's called smart lunchroom. And there are things such as placement, that the, the goodies that, as you talked about, the wonderful <laughs> things they have in Peru, they don't have them out front. So there, there's a science to doing this. And I guess what I say, or maybe would ask you to comment, um, can we broaden it to understand how people make their choices, how they feed their children, and then incorporate the wonderful science of what we know about nutrition into that? Please. Thank you very much for that, because probably what we did, we tried to really uh, discuss specific areas, and we didn't really talk about the big picture, and you're definitely right. I totally agree with you, and there are many other you know, factors related. It has to do, for example, with the child that you mentioned, the way it goes to school, uh, where he passes from. If there are many supermarkets around the area, we do know where if you put the product in front, it's probably better than if you put it in the back. And I totally agree with you that we need the help of other sciences. What you said is really important. We need sociologists, and you already mentioned about psychology. And uh, oh, we don't have the time to talk about all this new um, uh, you know, data we have. Uh, regarding behavior change techniques. And definitely we need these techniques in order to be able, you know, to go and really educate, as we said before, <laughs> the family. Um, but there are some, 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 such interesting studies now regarding um, new technology, again, that they follow the whole environment. You, I'm sure you're aware of that with sensors, and they see the distance, for example, from the house to the supermarket, and how far the supermarket is affects the type of foods you buy if there is an availability of fresh foods close to you. So there are so many factors. Actually, we had a study recently uh, that in the Mediterranean countries, who cooks the food is very important in the family. And uh, we just had a publication that there are, uh, in, in many countries, not only in Greece, uh, grandparents are cooking the food. And we educate the parents, and we don't educate the grandparents. So we can talk about factors, and it's a multifactorial problem, it's a multi-sector <laughs> is a multi-environmental <laughs> approach we have to, and thank you very much, because uh, we, we, we forget uh, stressing it all the time. We have to say about that. It's not one or two or three or four factors involved. There's so many different uh, factors, and of course that there are all these good studies that they give us result of this multi-sector approach. Please. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Maureen. So everything I... I know from that I learned from Maureen. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 again, could, could not agree more. And, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, the whole understanding that, yes, if, what, if, if the goal of ultimate education is to get, uh, let's say, if we're talking early life, parents and families, I totally agree to uh, engage in a behavior, right, uh, or, or ultimately deliver a behavior that ends up with a healthy diet and, in turn, good nutrition. Uh, once again, it has to be multi-sectorial. In fact, you know, the best understanding, I don't have to tell you, the people who know where to put things in a supermarket to get them out is not the government, right? It is the private sector that runs the supermarkets. So, uh, so I think it becomes even more important that when we're talking about, you know, mechanisms to uh, address the behaviors that ultimately lead to healthy diets, uh, we have to we, we have to do it jointly, uh, and that absolutely means uh, doing it starting with the nucleus, which is uh, the household, 
uh, and then extending to you know the concentric circles that you know that that uh, that kids have. I think uh, I would like to add to that that uh, the whole process is really a multisensory experience for the consumer, and I think they need they need really the impact on on food industry as well, so that you would you would design products that people would choose not because of their nutri nutrition value but the nutrition and the good nutrition would come as a side effect, so to say. So somehow to make the multisensory experience for healthy foods more appealing still. And I, when I was in industry, there were several stories of the stealth, trying to make a food healthier so that people would have that food, and then you know trying to add a value for same price. They don't Consumers don't buy those. And so it's mm -hmm. not like industry can try to push it and it just affects. So to your point, you have to think about sensory, you have to think about you know early stage life and what kind of patterns people develop. You have your favorite foods and you learn those pretty early on and you want them to stay the same throughout your life. So it's, it's all of those factors and I think bringing in industry and some of the marketing aspect and what we know as a positive, um, I think sometimes with nutrition, we want everybody to be a nutrition scientist and want to eat based on the best nutrients because they, that's the right thing to do. But they consume foods based on taste, based on where they fit in their life, et cetera. So we need to bring that in. So I think your point was well made. Very good. Well, our time is up. Um, I really want to thank the panel um, and our speakers from this morning for the really rich dialogue. And thank you for your excellent questions. <laughs>